I'm Bharat from Yukon HKN, and I'm going to go over some in, an introduction to semiconductor. Now, before I can do that, I'm going to go over just vaguely what conductors, insulators, and semiconductors are. Now, conductors, their definition is that they flow electrons. So if you think of examples, you're thinking of aluminum, uh, any gold, anything like that. And when you think insulators, you think the exact opposite. Insulators tend to inhibit the flow of electrons. So that's going to be your rubbers, wood, even glass. Now, the reason I even want to talk about this in relation to semiconductors is semiconductors sort of combine the best of both of those materials. So the way you can define a semiconductor is they're sort of in between an insulator and a conductor, where they allow for the flow of electrons, but you can control that. Um, now, one material that I'm going to focus on specifically is something called silicon. Now, silicon is group 14 in the elemental table, but that's not what we're really focusing on. Now, silicon, the reason we want to talk about it is it's been around for the last 50 years. It's been sort of the building block of electronics, building blocks of computing, and any other uh, stuff an electrical engineer would come across today. So what ends up happening is a silic silicon is in group four of the elemental table. Now, what that means is if you look at just a single silicon atom, you see that it has four valence electrons. Now, a quick uh, recap from chemistry, or the overall valence shell will have eight if it will become unsta uh, uh, stable. So particles are always trying to find that balance between zero and eight. So when you have something like four, it's on the fringe of both sides. So it is more readily available to, it's a very flexible material. It's readily able to give up its electrons or accept electrons. Now, what we're able to do is, if you look at the structure of sort of a crystalline lattice, they are bound together by something called covalent bonds. Just another quick chemistry recap, covalent bonds are where they share electrons. So both these silicon atoms will share the same electrons. And if we want to represent that in the actual crystalline form, you'll get something that looks like a 3D triangle we call it a tetrahedral. All right. Now, what ends up happening with this crystal wafer is thermal energy is going to cause these electrons to sort of break their covalent bonds. So this can occur when we apply some sort of voltage bias. And what ends up happening is you'll have an electron that'll leave. The electron will come over here, and this will become an empty area. Now this empty area is actually considered a hole. So a hole is actually the absence of electrons. It's a little bit of a weird uh, concept, but we can sort of think of it as sort of a vacuum where it is more likely to accept an electron in that area. Now, and it also becomes an unfilled energy state. So one way that people, uh, engineers are able to represent this is with an energy band, di band diagram. So if you look at an energy band diagram, we have the bottom layer, which is the valence band. We have the top layer, which is the conduction band. So what ends up happening is holes, these like, positively charged carriers, are going to reside below the valence band. While if you look above the conduction band, that's where you find your electrons. So what ends up happening is when you apply some sort of bias, that is when electrons will sort of jump through this barrier and sort of reside within the upper layer, and they leave behind a hole. Now, what, one thing to note is that this area in the middle can be labeled EG, or band gap. Now, EG in a simple form is just the amount of energy required to re cause the particles with below the valence band and the conduction band to react. So when we actually have full-blown circuits, what ends up happening is we need to apply an X amount of bias, this EG, 
before we actually have some sort of movement within the device. Now, if you actually relate this back to what I went over before, the reason metals are able to allow for the flow of electrons is that when you look at their band gap, it's actually really small. Um, these two areas, believe it or not, the conduction and valence band are pretty much on top of each other. So that means you have movement between electrons and holes constantly, and that's what allows metals to really flow their electrons at such a rapid rate. They're able to conduct really easily. On the other hand, with insulators, if, we, if I want to compare this band gap, insulators uh, will be something like this. Have the valence band up here, and you'll have the conduction band up here. And if you look at that, the amount of energy required is so large that these materials are never going to actually conduct. Okay? So, why did I talk to you about this stuff? Well, I'm going to relate it to actually how we actually create devices. So what we end up doing to actually get silicon to work our way is we dope it. We implant some sort of impurity that is either more negatively doped or more positively doped. And they're called N-type and P-type uh, semiconductors, depending on how they're doped. We can define N-type as donors and we can define p-type as acceptors. So what we're really looking for is when I say something is n-type, it is pretty much it pretty much has more electrons within its outer shell. So if you're looking at the elemental table, it is pretty much anything above group 4. Your group 5s, your group 6s, your group 7s. That being said, we like to keep it not as heavily n-doped, so we're going to use in our case Phosphorus. Oh. So phosphorus, if you remember its structure, it has five valence electrons. So it'll be something like this. Five valence. It has an extra valence electron. On the other hand, when we look at p-types, we're going to look at something like group three. And that's going to leave us with something like boron. Boron would be positively charged because it has less electrons then silicon and phosphorus. Now when you actually combine these two into one structure, you'll have something like this. So, uh, I'll bring one of these down here to be even, and then I can actually take... Oh no, this is correct. All right. Um, so when we look at when we implant phosphorus into silicon, we can actually see that there are more electrons. So that means there's going to be more movement within the conduction band, and that imbalance is going to cause movement within the carriers. There's also p-type. It's going to have something like this. And as I said before, this situation just has less uh, electrons, they're going to have more holes. Electron holes are the opposite of electrons, and you can see that compared to phosphorus and silicon structures, it has less overall valence electrons. And then we're going to just talk about how do we sort of calculate the electron and hole concentration. So when I look at electron concentration, we're going to represent that with the variable NPO. And then we're going to set that equal to an ni squared divided by an na. Now what this equation is showing is the electron, uh, electron concentration is equal to the intrinsic concentration squared divided by the acceptor count. When I use the word intrinsic, all I'm saying is it is neither positively doped or negatively doped. That means it has the same number of positive and negative carriers. So all I'm doing in this situation is I'm taking the overall what it takes to be intrinsic. I divide it by what, how many actual positive carriers are in the system. And I'm going to get the amount of negative carriers or the electron concentration. The same thing can be done with hole concentration. So if you ever need to calculate that, that'll be something like this.
and all that, it says the same exact thing. The whatever is required to be intrinsic divided by the amount of negative dopants is going to give us the amount of positive carriers. Now one thing to note are these small subscripts. This pretty much says the electron concentration in a p-type device. You can also write that as NNO. NNO would be the electron concentration in a N-type silicon. Likewise with holes you can do PPO and that just means the amount of positive carriers within a P-type semiconductor. Okay, and then just to wrap it up, I'm just gonna give you a quick reminder that if this is the conduction band and this is the valence band, what we have to also draw is something called a Fermi level. Now a Fermi level is this dotted line. It sort of represents the probability that you're going to have holes or electrons below that point. Now in a, a p-type device, your valence band would actually be, your, your Fermi level would actually be on the lower end. Because if you were to choose a point, you'd be more likely to choose values that are closer to the bottom where all the holes exist. And then if I wanted to make a n-type device, the Fermi level would be up here. So the probability of me choosing electrons would be much higher up here because this is where all the electrons reside. Okay, just to, so that is, that's all I really want to go over for now. It should just be a basic introduction on how to dope semiconductors, why we use silicon, and in the next lecture, I'm looking to go over how do we represent that more in band diagrams and how do we go about solving for di diodes with certain bias or how to actually apply this within MOSFETs. Hey guys, if you like the uh, content that I produced or any of the Yukon HKN content, Please leave us comments. It's the best way for us to improve. And I hope to see you guys next time.